What's up everyone? Today's video and series is going to be a little bit different from the one I have on the greatest album covers of all time. This one is solely going to be on the most controversial and censored album covers of all time. These album covers aren't necessarily the greatest of all time, like I said, but just controversial in one way or another. And because of that, they can also be censored in some way. I was actually wondering why more artists didn't put out more controversial album covers back then to get notoriety. But then I thought about how it is now with every female artist putting their sexuality front and center in today's music industry. They're either performing in next to nothing, shaking their butts, or have very sexualized music videos. When everything is controversial, then nothing is. It loses its shock factor if the entire industry is saturated with stuff like that. I'm not going to be able to show some of the album covers in this series in their entirety because they're sexual in nature, or there's some nudity and it might get the videos blocked, so I'll have to use a censored version. So if you see black bars, it means there'd be some nips or cooters in this house or something else. All right, so let's just start off with the very well-known band. First up is the album cover from the Beatles' 10th U.S. studio album called Yesterday and Today from 1966. There's a distinction between their U.K. studio albums and their U.S. studio albums. You would think if you put out an album, then it's just worldwide. But I guess back then, because of not having the internet for promotion, that they promoted albums wherever they really wanted to sell them and the Beatles were mostly popular in the UK at first. They put out an insane 29 studio albums in an eight year span from 1963 to 1970, and this is probably their most controversial album cover. Can you take a guess as to why? I know it's hard to tell, but give it a shot. It's not exactly a hidden reason with all the butchered baby dolls. This was known as the Butcher Cover. Robert Whittaker was the responsible photographer for this idea, and if you peruse the entire picture, then you can see the dismembered baby dolls, for which Jeffrey Dahmer would be proud of. You can also see different pieces of what seems like cow's meat and white butcher coats. Whittaker had actually assembled more props, including a hammer and nails, cardboard boxes, a bird cage, and sets of false teeth and eyes. I guess maybe he thought that that was taking it a step too far and left them out. I don't know. Whitaker was known for his surreal style, and John Lennon said that they were motivated by boredom and resentment at having to do another photo session and another Beatles thing. We were sick to death of it. The Beatles said that Whitaker's concept was compatible with their own black humor and interest in the avant-garde. The original release had three different versions with the cover that's shown here already, another one with the replacement artwork glued on top of the original, and then a sleeve of the replacement artwork on top of the original. This was the replacement artwork to please the complainers. It's known as the trunk cover, and you might be familiar with it. They seem to obviously be having more fun with the mutilated baby dolls. What's the world coming to when you can't celebrate butchering baby dolls and possibly eating them? Up next is an album cover from Ice Cube's solo career called Death Certificate from 1991. Ice Cube was of course a member of the controversial rap group NWA in the 1980s. This was Ice Cube's second studio album and it definitely brewed up a dirt storm. Eight Angry Bears is the artist responsible for the cover and I couldn't find even one single picture of him or her. As you can see, the cover consists of Ice Cube standing on the side of a body in what's probably a morgue and the body is draped in the American flag with a toe tag that reads, Uncle Sam. The musical content was just as controversial for this album because it dealt with family friendly topics such as racial profiling, drug dealing, political commentary, shootings, sex, and just living in the ghetto in general. It also has its fair share of homophobic remarks. The album cover artwork pissed off the good old boys though. Any proud American I'm sure would be upset with the image of a toe tag on the metaphorical American Republic. There was even a problem with the album in the UK when they excluded the songs Black Korea and No Vaseline on the album because they were worried about the laws about racial incitement. Island Records removed those two songs from the UK version without Ice Cube's consent. They did, however, reinstate those songs on the CD reissue. The album cover image also triggered a statewide ban in Oregon of any display in retail stores that included Ice Cube, including an advertisement he did for St. Ides Malt Liquor in 1992 that you see a variation of right here. Ice Cube's album Death Certificate went to number two on the Billboard 200, sold over 115,000 copies in its first week, and eventually was certified platinum for selling over 1 million copies. The album has since sold over 2 million copies total. This next one is the debut studio album from the rock band Dio, and it's from their album Holy Diver. It was definitely a risk for a new band to put out such a controversial album like this one because it has to do with religion and it was in 1983 when it was just a bit more conservative when coming to any type of criticism about religion. 
The initial illustration was by Gene Hunter, but the finished product was produced by Randy Barrett, both of whom I couldn't find any pictures of. The original illustration by Gene Hunter had the priest hanging upside down and chained to a cross, but they felt like the cross was too much. They drew the line at the cross being involved. That's just funny to me, and I'm not religious, but I mean, come on. It's like saying a pic of a naked woman would have been too much if her nipples were hard. In the final version here, you can see the moonlight breaking through the clouds while the band mascot Murray is standing over some mountains and has a chain in his hand connected to a priest that's tied up in the chain with a lock and seemingly being drowned in the ocean. This was the first use of the band's mascot Murray and they went on to utilize him in numerous album covers. Frontman Ronnie James Dio's wife Wendy came up with the idea for the cover and of course their record label wasn't exactly thrilled with the idea and asked Dio if he was really sure that he wanted to release the cover. The artwork is obviously open to interpretation, but Ronnie James Dio said, But the idea was to reverse the question of how come you've got a monster drowning a priest. We wanted to be able to say, how do you know it's not a priest drowning a monster? And I think that's kind of been proven out in the last 10 years with all of the problems we've had in the Catholic Church. In hindsight, I like to think we were right about who we put in the water. I kind of see what he means, but yeah, it's definitely a priest being drowned by a devil looking figure and not a priest causing self-inflicted harm because he's conflicted with who he is. I think he was maybe just trying to soften the controversy by explaining it that way. Now we come to an artist that everyone should expect something from that's a bit off the beaten path. This controversial album cover is from David Bowie and it's his album Diamond Dogs from 1974. This one was designed by Belgian painter Guy Pilaert. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's gonna have to do. As you can see, David Bowie is on the front cover with a naked upper body, but what you don't see until you fold the album sleeve all the way out is that it's a Bowie dog. He has the lower body of a dog, dangling balls and all. This was the airbrush cover that his record label RCA replaced the original cover with until it was reissued on CD in 1990 when they let the canine slash human testes hang once again in all their glory. He has a couple of other oddities behind him in kind of a freak show setting that you would have been able to see in Coney Island on the boardwalk back in the day and even today I think they still have it. I've actually been to one of those modern freak shows in Coney Island and it's nothing special. They got a guy there that speaks and just spits all over the place and that's part of the act. As a matter of fact the artist based the backdrop on a book he owned about Coney Island's Pleasure Park. I have no idea what Pleasure Park was because all I could find was when Luna Park opened in 1903 in Coney Island. Luna Park has been there forever obviously over a hundred years so Pleasure Park was either some freaky secret heat in this place or only existed in the author of that book's head. Another way you can tell the difference between the original cover and the airbrushed one, besides the obvious, is that they changed the word alive here to Bowie. I have no idea why. It seems like a very trivial thing to change and I can't see why it would make a difference. This album had a few uncensored copies that actually got through the filters and were released to the public before they could get airbrushed and they're among some of the most expensive albums for collectors costing somewhere in the thousands of dollars. Our second to last controversial and or censored album cover comes from a 90s rock band. This is Jane's Addiction with their album cover Ritual De Lo Habitual from 1990. This is the first one I'll have to censor even though they're not human nipples and carpet fuzz. Someone out there might get offended because they're too tempted to have impure thoughts. Ooh. These figures that seem to be having a great time are actually lead singer of Jane's Addiction, Perry Farrell, with two women. Perry Farrell actually created it. They're not doing anything untoward. I got it from a good source that they were just discussing different knitting techniques. So, it wasn't the record label or a religious group or soccer moms that wanted this cover changed to something more PG-13, but it was actually the retail stores that wanted Farrell to change it. He actually obliged them by making it an all-white cover with the First Amendment printed on the front, and what you can see here about Hitler and fascism on the back of the cover. Farrell is obviously saying that if people are forced to obey authoritarian wishes about the arts or expression, then there's nothing stopping someone like Hitler doing what he did once again and dictating what people can and can't say or produce, or at least something to that effect. Our last album cover appears to be very prophetic and eerie. This one is from Leonard Skinner and it's called Street Survivors from 1977. This album wouldn't be controversial if it wasn't for a tragic event that happened just days after this album was released. So let's get into the album cover image first. As you can see, the band is standing in the street with buildings and surrounding areas engulfed in flames. 
Like I already said, this wouldn't be controversial under any other circumstances, but the band was actually in a plane crash just three days after this album was released. They were on their way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana when they crashed near Gillsburg, Mississippi. The pilot, co-pilot, the group's assistant road manager, and three band members, Ronnie Van Zant, Steve Gaines, and Gaines' older sister, backup singer Cassie Gaines, all died, and those who survived were severely injured. The album cover and the title of the album took on new meaning after the crash, and out of respect for those that lost their lives in the crash, the record label MCA changed the album cover to have the band with just a simple black background. It was also requested by Steve Gaines' widow, Teresa, to change it. I guess it wasn't out of too much respect, though, because the original cover was brought back for the album's deluxe edition. Alright, so some of those were fun, weird, and just downright sad. What I find interesting is that some albums can be more revered or noticed for what's not even the main reason that was intended. The music. There are also some people that buy the albums just for the artwork, and they don't even care about the music. I mean, some of these albums were high on the charts, but did the artwork help that somewhat? I bet it probably did. And the people that have at least one of those David Bowie albums, Diamond Dogs, are oh, some happy SOBs. Alright, so if you haven't checked out my other series on the greatest album covers of all time, then go check it out if you're interested in that topic. And I'll see you next week with the new video.